Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. Episode 272, Legends of the Baker Street Journal, Christopher Morley. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, it's... I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Oh, Holmes the meddler. Holmes the busybody. Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. Ha! The game's afoot as we interview authors, editors, creators, and other prominent Sherlockians on various aspects of the great detective in popular culture. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Bert Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! I'm Bill Curtis. This is I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Now, here are your hosts, Scott Monty and Bert Walder. Hello and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, you are such a legend yourself. How are you these days? (laughs) I'm a legend in my own mind, and um, I hardly know what to say about that. I'm, uh, uh, what, what are some other uses of the word legend? You know, legend, you always look for the legend of... Um, well, the legend of Sleepy Hollow. It's uh, an interesting word. You know, you're more of a map legend kind of guy. Oh, that's right. Maps yeah. have legends, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah. I'm north by northwest, then. <laughs> You know, I just think it's so fortunate that Hitchcock made that film in the late 50s, because if he had tried to make it after the 2008 merger, he would have had to make it north by Delta. Just (laughs) doesn't have the same ring to it. North by Delta. Oh, dear. I I know. Well, we're not here to talk about mergers or acquisitions or legends. Well, actually, we are here to we talk are. about a legend. Uh-huh. One specific legend, Christopher Morley, who was uh, a, a truly amazing guy. Uh, you know, he was a, a, a writer, a critic, an editor, uh, an advisor of the literary scene, a founder extraordinaire. And we're going to be talking to a man who probably knows him best uh, by the name of Steve Rothman. Uh, Steve is an editor emeritus of the Baker Street Journal. And, well, we'll tell you a little bit more about Steve in his uh, bio, but he is the morally expert uh, to have on here. I can think of maybe only one other who could match Steve. So uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, Morley and his uh, a little bit about his background and how the Baker Street Irregulars came to be formed as well as the Baker Street Journal. We're going to have quite a few links in this episode, including previous episodes that you'll want to link it with and a number of books as well. So make sure you check out the show notes at ihose.co slash ihose272 and you can... Uh, Check out all of those links as well as the links associated with uh, Patreon. Patreon, that's right, where we give you ad-free episodes for, in return for uh, support for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, that would entitle you to not only those episodes, but also bonus material. Uh, we do occasionally have outtakes and extra content from various episodes, so make sure you check it out at ihose.co slash ihose272.
Stephen Rothman edited the Baker Street Journal from 2000 to 2022 and is now the editor emeritus. He holds the Two Schilling Award from the Baker Street Irregulars. He writes and talks about the works of Christopher Morley and edited The Standard Doyle Company, Christopher Morley on Sherlock Holmes, as well as A Remarkable Mixture, award-winning articles from the Baker Street Journal. With the late Nicholas Utekin, he edited To Keep the Memory Green, Reflections of the Life of Richard Lancelin Green. In 2008, he delivered the Cameron Hollier Memorial Lecture to the friends of the Arthur Conan Doyle Collection of the Toronto Public Library. He most recently gave the third annual BSI Trust Lecture on the correspondence between Christopher Morley and Edgar W. Smith. A dedicated book collector since the age of 12, he's also the president, apparently for life, of the Filio Biblon Club of Philadelphia. Steve Rothman, welcome back to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. It's a pleasure, Bert. Thank you. Uh, uh, Scott, Bert, uh, both of you. Um, <laughs> And clearly, I don't even know where I am. Uh, but yes, it is a pleasure. And uh, I have had such fun in the past that I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Excellent. Well, you yeah. are, you're back for a fifth time. So wow. you're, you're no uh, spring chicken around these parts. I would have said four, but good. Uh, excellent. Well, you, uh, you know, last time we, we talked with you here, I think we talked with you about uh, our mutual friend, Nick Utekin, um, which was a you know, wonderful show back on 249. And we'll have links to these episodes in the show notes if people want to get to them. Um, but more importantly, and more to our topic here back in episode 221, how's, how appropriate is that? We talked to you about the Baker Street Journal. And uh, here we come full circle to the guy who made the Baker Street Journal possible by virtue of creating the Baker Street Irregulars in the first place. Christopher Morley, um, a giant in our little hobby here. But if you were to recommend someone uh, who wished to familiarize themselves with Kit Morley, where would you start the conversation? Where would you point them? For most people, I would say the thing to do is start with his first novel, which is Parnassus on Wheels. Um, well, actually, yes, Parnassus on Wheels, which is about a, um, a bookshop, a horse-drawn bookshop going around upstate New York and um, narrated by one of the characters. It has a strong female lead. It has a, an interesting um, man there, and it's it's a lot of book talk from the twenties. So most of the titles will be unfamiliar to you, but it's also charming. And then it has a sort of a sequel, which is called the Haunted Bookshop, which uh, the or Parnassus at Home, which is when the booksellers um, are now in a shop in Brooklyn which turns into a spy story uh, with an attempt to assassinate um, Woodrow Wilson on his way to the Versailles Peace Conference. Yes, it does, because <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you why and how. It's too insane. Um, but if you want, these are both, however, obviously early works. Um, and if you wanted something more mature and more interesting in every way, I would suggest that anyone should read his novel Kitty Foyle, which is superb. Its um, character, its lead character is Kitty Foyle. She is the narrator. It's an entirely um, an interior monologue um, about this girl who comes from a poor working class part of Philadelphia and um, falls in love with a boy from the Philadelphia main line who is rich and old family. And it's remarkable. It really is remarkable that a man could have written this book in the late 1930s. And it got him in a lot of trouble because it mentions abortion. It mentions other things like this. But it's a tour de force. I really strongly recommend it. Otherwise, I would say almost any of his essays, just pick up an essay and you'll be charmed. You'll be in, you'll learn something about when he's talking about other writers or other places, he's 
a good and no longer much appreciated author. Hmm. Stephen, when, you know, normally on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, we always ask people when they first met Sherlock Holmes, but when did you first meet Christopher Morley? Uh-huh. When, when did... Uh-huh. Uh, well, and how, and how did that happen? <laughs> well, it happened in my uh, junior high school library where we were sent from the English class up to the library to pick out a book to read. And I happened to pick, God knows why, uh, Parnassus on Wheels, flipping through. So it was about a bookshop. I like books. Gee. <laughs> um, well, I read it that night. I loved it. And I read, wrote my book report um, and... Then I went back the next day and found the Haunted Bookshop, and I read that. And then I read the third and final book that was in that library, which was Travels in Philadelphia. Now, I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, very near to where Christopher Morley grew up. His father, in his first 10 years, was a professor of mathematics at Haverford College, and I grew up not a mile from the college campus. So I knew some of the places that he was talking about, both in the city and in the suburbs. And after that, I went to my public library and found some other books. And then I had to start buying them because, <laughs> you know, I, there was this long list of books in the front of the, of the books that he'd written and I couldn't find them. So, but there were used bookshops around, which I was already familiar with. And 50 cents, a dollar, maybe two dollars. This is a long time ago, boys and girls. <laughs> um, and I could uh, read these things. At the same time, to answer your second question, I had uh, ordered from a remainder house, Marlboro Books. Bert, you'll remember that. Oh, sure. Um, I had ordered for a dollar um, William Baringold's uh, Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street which I thought was the funniest book I had ever read because <laughs> it's a biography of a fictional character. This was great. I tortured my friends. I tortured my family for weeks and weeks and weeks. And when I finally, I was just thought it was the best. I was instantly a scholarly Sherlockian. Um, and when I read in the appendix that there was Christopher Morley and your know, books by I thought, well, there we are. It is fate. So I started having to search out um, Sherlockiana as well as Morleana. And there we are. And so things have not been the same. And this is, as I say, a very, very long time ago. Hmm. What about what? And, you know, I was going to just ask you what attracted you with, with Parnassus and Wheels. But it's sort of it's sort of obvious. You know, Morley is, has been over the years... Uh, characterized as sentimental, I think, by, in fact, his brother. I remember after he passed, listening to a recording, I think it was of Frank or Felix or somebody at a Baker Street you know, regulars gathering who described, you know, Morley as a great sentimentalist. But but what's your thinking about that as a characteristic of his writing? Because there is, there is sort of a, in his essays and in Parnassus on Wheels and in other places, there's sort of an affectionate rosy glow around, around things that's that's unintended but there. And and I was just curious about how you tend to characterize his 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 writing, if you do. I th- I tend to characterize it as enthusiastic, more than sentimental. He loved what he loved, which was a great many things, including people. Um, He loved his friends. He loved his family. He loved his books. He loved the authors that appealed to him who were very varied. Conan Doyle, obviously. George Gissing, Stevenson. um, Endless number of... He was a real reader, a serious reader, all his life from boyhood on, and he was a judge for the Book of the Month Club for many, many years, um, which meant that every month, every month, never-ending, buried in advanced copies and galley proofs and things like this of every book that was coming out pretty much in the U.S., and he read lots of them. And he would write his reports, and he would write his notes, and they would argue about them. And um, 
who got to do what and who. It was a fascinating thing. I've seen his lecture notes for various lectures that he would give at or at college campuses or to you know bookish places around the country because this was one of the ways he supplemented his um, earnings a lot, in, especially in the 30s. And they're almost pictographs. Clearly, he, I could tell he had these stories. One was about the golden spectacles. I don't know what it was. I have no idea. I've never been able to figure it out. But he just would draw these like pince uh, sort of things. And he would have other little strange notes to himself. And but he would go there, he would happily go around the country talking about books all around the country. He, it, was, it was a way of making a living and it was important to him that way, but it was also important to him that he made people love books. I think he, he so loved what the Book of the Month Club was doing. Here it was a, a place for people who lived in the middle of nowhere and had nothing but rural free delivery. They could get those brand new books in their mailbox every month. <laughs> and this was important to him. He loved the idea. He basically invented the idea of the bookmobile with, with Parnassus on wheels. And he loved what these were, that either if they were, there were such things as um, bookmobiles selling books, and then the libraries who did it. And he thought this was the best, that people who could not come to the books, the books would come to them. That's really uh, remarkable. I mean, we, we look at it with today's lens and it's kind of, okay, yeah, but it's the, we, we have all of these things or we have had all these things. But uh, here he was uh, just after the turn of the century inventing a lot of this stuff. And I, I think it might be helpful for people to understand uh, the uh, popularity, the allure, the notoriety of uh, Christopher Morley, because he was more than uh, just an author of a few books, wasn't he? He was what we call anymore a boldface name. You would open up your newspapers or your magazines, and almost every week, there he'd be in the columns, either something he wrote or somebody is writing a paragraph about him. He was on the air, on the radio. Uh, he was a frequent guest, a panelist on Information Please, where they would try and, which was a quiz show. And then there was also the Transatlantic Quiz, which was done between, with the BBC. And there would be um, panelists in both New York and in London. And so he became equally well known there. And when he would go uh, to visit his sister or, and family in, in the UK, he was written about as if he was a famous guy in all the London papers as well. And he was known. Uh, there, he was on some of the newsreels. He, he was pretty much everywhere. His name sold books, both books by him and the blurbs that he wrote helped sell books by others. So he was, it, he helped he thought it was great fun when he, early, early in his career, his first job was working for uh, Doubleday, um, and he was sent as sort of a representative of the house to various bookshops around Christmas time to help push the Doubleday titles. And he would push the Doubleday titles, but he'd also push anybody else's books if they were good books. He tells this story or actually, I think Doubleday tells this story about meeting him for the first time. Uh, Morley had been trying to get a job at Doubleday's when he was back in New York after having been a Rhodes Scholar. And he had made all sorts of lists. And he comes in, and he, you know, they tell him to go away, go away, go away. And he keeps coming back. And finally, one day, you know, the guy who's been telling him to go away you know, says, all right, you know, go see the old man. You, you've got five minutes. And he goes in to see Frank Doubleday, the founder of the feast, and he starts talking. He says, and what can we do for you, young man? What job would you like here? And Morley looks him in the eye and says, yours. Uh, but he pulls out lists of uh, series that they could do and new authors and old authors and anthologies and this and that. And he just talks nonstop. And so just to shut him up, Doubleday gives him a job and puts him off and so when this other guy comes back from lunch 
And there's Chris busily beavering away, and I don't think he ever quite understood how it happened. Um, <laughs> and he was there for several years, uh, happily working as a publisher. I think he would have stayed, but he was offered more money to write for a newspaper in Philadelphia where he started writing columns, which he did for the rest of his career. And that that Doubleday Association, that's where we get that wonderful introduction that Christopher Morley wrote for the Doubleday edition of The Complete Sherlock Holmes, is it not? Well, they were his first publisher. They were mostly his publisher. His poetry was early on issued by Duran, but Duran merged with Doubleday. Um, and so Doubleday was his publisher for most of his time. He left them briefly uh, to go to Lippincott's when an associate of his at Doubleday left them to go to Lippincott's and he was showing loyalty to a friend. Um, but he went back to Doubleday for the end of his career. And yes, um, Dub when Doubleday, and I think this was partly it, from the urging of Chris, decided that, oh, look, we've got the rights to almost all of these Sherlock Holmes stories because they owned Duran, they bought McClure as well. And so all, all the book houses that had originally published the stories in the U.S. were owned by Doubleday, except for one or two stories, uh, which were probably out of copyright, don't tell the Doyle estate. Um, <laughs> and so he was approached and, and they said, you know, how much do you want to write this? And he said, well, enough to get me to London. Um, so he did. He wrote this wonderful piece, as you say, uh, In Memoriam Sherlock Holmes, which is probably the single most read, most familiar, most widely printed piece of Sherlockian scholarship that there is. Huh. I had no idea. Think about it. How yeah. many zillions of copies, and it's been in other editions. I of mean, course. Barnes and Noble used it in their edition as well, and, and other places it's been in English editions. It's it's everywhere, and it's probably never been out of print since it first came out in 1930, so almost 100 years later. And you can still go into your local bookshop, if you can find one, and um, find a copy of the canon with Chris's introduction in it. Doesn't mean he gets any money from it, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was always doing things like that, wasn't he? I mean, I had the sense that, um, you know, if he could arrange it, he would cheerfully be. And, and there, of course, is a great story, too. I remember that he told or wrote about where he was out on a boat for some reason with people and very bad weather. And the highlight of returning to shore was passing Camden, New Jersey, where the Campbell Company, uh, you know, was. And he thought immediately of hot soup. I, but he would always do things like sort of take a cruise if he could afford it. He loved to travel when he could. Is that is that accurate? He loved boats. He loved boats. Absolutely. He, he loved to travel. It's true. But he, he loved boats more than trains, more than planes. Um more than cars, and he always named his cars. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but he, he loved traveling by, by a boat. Um, his parents, who were both English-born and never actually became American citizens, would go back, because his father was an academic, almost every year um, to England to see family and or did um, sabbaticals in Germany and other places. And they would take the boys along and they would travel cheaply because, again, academics. Um, but this is, he always, in fact, enjoyed traveling in the lesser class boats rather than the big names. He wasn't traveling on the Queen Elizabeth or the Queen Mary. He was traveling on ships that, you mostly wouldn't have heard of today. And he and his friends um, in the Three Hours for Lunch Club, which was a semi-imaginary group that in one take ultimately became the Baker Street Irregulars, um, actually bought a boat. They bought a, a three-mast sailing boat that they named uh, Tusatola, which was the name that the Samoans called um, Robert Louis Stevenson. Hmm. And... They, their timing was not great. Um, it was the 20s. Uh, they 
realized that they really couldn't afford it. And after a couple of years, they sold it to one of their members. But it was still around until the 60s under various names. It became a training ship for um, midshipmen. Uh, <laughs> you can see pictures of it. Mm, one's wonderful. Yeah. You know, you, you mention um, his family, his, his mother, his father, never became American citizens. For, you know, for our listeners, can you talk for a minute or two about his brothers and how they sort of stacked up educationally and professionally? Because we don't spend a lot of time talking about his brothers, but in their way, they were remarkable people. Absolutely. These were three amazing men. So the middle brother... Chris was the oldest of three. The middle brother, Felix, um, became, first went into newspapers. First, he worked for the League of Nations. Then he was into newspapers. He became uh, editor of the Washington Post and earned it its first um, Pulitzer Prize and went on to some other papers. He started a... Um, conservative magazine called um, Current Events, and he was um, president of Haverford College during the war years, um, and he was very, had worked with Hoover in his um, famine relief after World War I, and his papers are at the Hoover Library. Um, so he was really very interesting guy who writes well about politics of the day. He was even spoken of for a bit as a possible Republican candidate for president in uh, 48. Obviously, Dewey beat him out. Um, but he, in his diaries, you can see him seriously considering this. I don't think he would have had a chance. Um, and then the youngest brother, Frank, um, Frank Jr., if you want, because his, their father was also a Frank, um, was um, a publisher in London and worked mostly with as a partner for Faber and Faber. Then during the war, he came back to New York and uh, worked with um, the war information people and things like this. And um, then after the war, his wife wanted to return to England, so they and their children went back, and he worked for several other publishers and educational foundations. After that, all three brothers wrote many books. All three brothers were Rhodes Scholars. I believe, to this day, the only three brothers who were Rhodes Scholars. Um, Frank had a PhD in mathematics, like his father, and uh, co-wrote a book on inversive geometry, don't ask me what it is, uh, with his dad. Um, Frank Frank's has some interesting things. He wrote a mystery, which has a, a Moriarty-type character in it um, that's pretty good. And um, a book about chess, which is mostly an autobiographical book about his family. Um, they're fun. Hmm. We're going to pause here a moment for a quick word from our sponsor. Hey, I hear you over there. You must be scratching your head wondering what's new with our friends at MX Publishing. Well, let me tell you, if you don't go to their website often, it is worth a visit because I can tell you just this summer, we've had a number of publications, like The Recollections of Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Hall, Sherlock Holmes, A Question of Time by Glenn Searfoss, Sherlock Holmes, A Study in Illustrations, Volume 4 by Mike Foy, and Oscar Slater, A Killer Exposed by Brenda Rossini. But coming up, there are at least five books that are going to be released in September, as well as... Gosh, another six or seven in October. Everything from Nessie's Nemesis, Sherlock's Secretary, Book Two by Chris Chan, Sherlock Holmes, Tales of Darkness by Paul D. Gilbert, Sherlock Holmes and a Tale of Greed by Daniel D. Victor, Sherlock Holmes, The Devil's Disciples by Richard Ryan, 
a study in statecraft by Orlando Pearson, and many, many more. Just get over to mxpublishing.com and check out their new books to see exactly what fits your appetite today. I'm Bill Curtis. This is I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Now here are your hosts, Scott Monty and Bert Walder. You uh, a few minutes ago mentioned the three hours for lunch club, which, as you say, was fictional. But the concept, I think, remains alive in um, in our hearts and and uh, certainly in practice from time to time. I know Bert uh, throws a wonderful uh, three hours for lunch club meeting every. Thursday of the BSI weekend uh, for a small group. But uh, talk to us a little bit about how that concept was applied to people around Chris who liked Sherlock Holmes and, and what that turned into. Okay. Chris loved starting clubs. Even in surviving issues of a newspaper that he and his friends put out um, a little typewritten thing. You can see they had various clubs, including uh, one that was called the TSO4, the sign of the four, um, when they were boys in Baltimore around the turn of the last century. And then he had started clubs with friends when he was at Haverford College as an undergraduate, and then went in Oxford when he was there as a Rhodes Scholar. So when he became a publisher, he started another club called the Small Fry, which shows the young men in the publishing business. And then he started writing about the Three Hours for Lunch Club, which wasn't entirely fictional. I was being a little harsh there. Um, it was, it would meet when the whim would take him or when someone was in from out of town that would give an excuse for them to gather. And they would go places like Philadelphia or Hoboken or down to the shipyards and they would meet. And so over time, they would do various things to record things. Chris loved to have souvenirs. I think this might be part of the sentimental bit that was talked about earlier. And he would grab a book off a used book stall from their nickel books and the, everyone there would sign it. I have something from some outing that they went to once, um, and people would sign it. So one time they started signing in a book by the Austrian uh, playwright uh, Grillparzer. Um, it uh, was a book of criticism on Grillparzer's plays, none of which I've ever read or seen. Um, and over time they started, and this would be in the early 30s, or even the late 20s, they started challenging each other over bits from the canon. They would say, no, who was the um, most dangerous man in London or the second most dangerous man in London? How many steps to Baker Street? This sort of thing. This sort of thing that most of us could answer right off the top of our heads. But it would be a challenge for drinking. And, um, and it, the loser would have to buy a round. So... Out of this, bit by bit, it became something that they sort of called the Baker Street Irregulars. And Chris would write about it in his column in the Saturday Review, and it hit a nerve with his readers. The readers said, tell us more, tell us more. We want to know about the Baker Street Irregulars. So um, he arranged with his um, publishers to have a uh, cocktail hour meeting, and then, which he said, you know, for people who had solved a crossword puzzle that his brother Frank had made. His brother Frank had made this puzzle about Sherlock Holmes while well aboard ship without any copy of the Sherlock Holmes stories available to him. And he, only one of the clues is probably wrong, which is a pretty impressive thing. Um, I don't think I could do it. But so the, the winners of the cocktail, uh, the crossword puzzle, were invited to this dinner. And then Chris had another dinner for his friends. It was a small group, what, 20-some, wasn't it, Bert? 
Scott? Something like that. I think that's about 15 yes, to 20 people. 15, yeah. 20 yeah, people. I think yeah. so, yeah. Uh, including uh, William Gillette, who for <laughs> all of them in the room was the personification of Sherlock Holmes. And Frederick Dorr Steele, who had been drawing uh, Sherlock Holmes for the American magazines for, as far as most of them were concerned, forever, you know, because mm. he had been doing it since the 90s. Um, they were there. Alexander Wolcott was invited by Vincent Starrett, who was also there having, and Starrett's private life of Sherlock Holmes had already come out. And most of the rest were people who were friends of Chris's, um, which is fine after all, this is club. And people ate this up. I mean, if you were a publicist and wanted to come up with some way to make something famous, you couldn't have done better. Um, Chris, Chris would have made a fortune had he gone into advertising instead of journalism and writing it. He was a brilliant ideas guy. He could come up with these ideas and spin them and the public ate them up. And so Baker Street Irregulars, he had a couple dinners. I think it was after that, it was mostly something that he thought he would revive at some time but the world was heading off to war by the late 30s, and I don't think it was the first thing on his mind. Uh, but Edgar Smith, as we mentioned earlier, came along and said, how about the seven Baker Street regulars? Can I go to a dinner? Huh, huh, can I, can I, can I, can I? Huh, what about it? I would love to go to a dinner. This would be really great. I'll help, let me help. And you know, so finally, finally there was a dinner, um, <laughs> entirely due to Edgar um, doing, because Chris basically says to him, you want to do all the heavy lifting? <laughs> God bless. Here's a list of the guys that have you know, come to other dinners and that I know about. You know, I'll be there, I'll lead it, but you, know, you do all the work. And so he did from then on until he died in 1960. Um, <laughs> Well, and, and he was certainly the right man for the job because not only was he an able administrator and organizer, but he had a pool of four secretaries at his behest to help him with yeah. said administrativa. Exactly yes. right, because, you know, Chris, after he left the Saturday Review, had no secretary. And it would, meant that you would just have to be pecking out things on his typewriter himself. And... You know, he wasn't getting paid by the word for writing invitations to a dinner, so I don't think it interested him much. Hmm. And who could blame him? Uh, yeah. You know, you describe so well that, that early spirit and how connected it is to Morley, his love of clubs and gatherings and souvenirs and fun. And, you know, it's worth noting that he... Born in 1890, he lived through two world wars, and by the 1940s, by 1947 or so, he had tired of the formality of the Baker Street Irregulars, and you had edited a wonderful book, The Standard Doyle Company, Christopher Morley on Sherlock Holmes in 1990. And in there, you repeat his his sort of point of view in, a, in an unsent letter that Morley wrote in 1947, where he says to his, the person he's writing to, I found myself saying to old Edgar Smith, one of the VPs of General Motors, how ghastly it is that the bores and dimwits identify themselves to you, force it on you in the first 10 minutes. If, for the love of J. Finley Chris, they would only keep shut. Maybe you'd not guess it for years, but they have, by some infernal compulsion, no less uh, to let you know in the first 10 minutes that they are nuisance fools. By the time Elmer Davis and I left the cocktail room for the dining room, we knew that the poor so-and-so is a human licorice. <laughs> but he spent the next two hours enforcing our suspicion upon us. Can you imagine in a meeting of ostensibly grown-up people, he began yowling for autographs? <laughs> yeah, this is why it was an unsent letter. Um, <laughs> Chris would often work out his anger um, with on the typewriter. With, yeah. Right, with unsent letters, which he would then send off to one of his closer uh, confidants and say, you know, read it or throw it out, I don't care, but, you know, um, 
we're not to discuss it anymore beyond this. It was just a good way to vent, and probably a healthy way to vent. Um, but yeah, some of these people just, <laughs> and we're not going to mention any names, not that no, any of them are with no. us now, but um, they didn't, they were not welcome, and they were a little hard to take. And it became, it was something that was fun, but you know, he has another article on belonging to clubs where he talks about the various clubs he belonged to or had started over the years and it's a late piece and he talks about the BSI and he says now the Baker Street Regulars has a journal and correspondence and treasurer and this and that and many letters to be answered but not by me <laughs> um, and that was why he Edgar was the perfect person to come along and do all this um, and Edgar did a lot to make what we thought of as the BSI until the last 25 years or so. Um, it's changed again and it will change again. Um, you know, we're hit, hitting 90 come January and that's a good age. Um, and we'll, it will be a, it's a very different thing. You talk to older members. You talk to me. I mean, I've been going to these dinners since 1978. Um, and it's different than it was. And I know that if I was to make it another um, 48 years, 45 years, whatever that is, um, I would find it different again. And not for the worse, just different. Well, and that's just right. I mean, you know, Morley created the BSI. It is the only club that he created that is still extant. Uh, you know, everything else kind of was one and done or uh, was just a flight of fancy. And this really took off. And uh, as you say, uh, putting it in Edgar's hands was part of that genius. And one of the things that Edgar had already been doing before he arrived at Chris Morley's doorstep was publishing pamphlets. He, he was a writer himself. He was a speech writer um, at General Motors. Um, and then, of course, you have Chris, who is an inveterate writer of poems and plays and columns and novels and all the rest. And the two of them, with Ben Abramson in tow, we, we had uh, a show about Ben Abramson a few episodes ago on episode 269, uh, came up with this concept for a journal. And in many of those early editions of the old series journal, uh, Chris Morley's uh, clinical notes from a resident patient play a, a fairly um, major role in the BSJ. So walk us through what Morley's thoughts were on having an official publication for this fledgling society. I think he was amused by this because there was more and more stuff kept coming and coming. They had the, those anthologies. There was Profile by Gaslight. There was 221B in reverse order. But, um, and in Profile by Gaslight, which came out in, what, 44? Yeah. 40, yeah, 44. 44. And so in that, one of Morley's contributions was entitled A, a Clinical clinical notes by a resident patient. And it's a lot of shortish paragraphs, and it's what I guess about 10 pages. I don't have it nearby. Uh, but um, it was put together by Edgar, who was the editor of that volume, taking bits from Morley's letters to him and just assembling them into um, this contribution, this chapter. And then when they were coming up with this idea for a quarterly journal, which was originally to be called Baker Street Gazagene, um, Pache Peter Ruber's ghost, uh, but, uh, and, but quickly turned into being called just the Baker Street Journal. But when they did this, um, Edgar writes to Chris and he says, so would you like me to just, I presume you're bu busier than I am, <clears throat> which is something to say from a man who is um, 
a very high up in General Motors Corporation. Um, but he says, you're, bus- you're busier than I am. Would you like me to do the same as I did in before and just put together bits? And so uh, clearly Chris, although there isn't the response immediately, said, sure, let's do it that way. Uh, because he would often write little things about Sherlock Holmes to um, Edgar in his letters, which were frequent. So he was happy to do this. And so from the first issue in uh, January 46 uh, till Chris's death, Edgar was able to put together something for every issue of the journal except for one. And then even after uh, Chris died in the next Christmas annual, he was able to put together um, one last thing from other little bits. So very few of them were purposely written just for publication in the journal, but they could have been used in any number of ways, but some of them were. And it's interesting because it shows it shows Chris's mind going off in a dozen different directions, finding, I mean, truly, he heard of Sherlock Holmes everywhere. He saw his Sherlock Holmes, his connections to Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes in everything he read. He'd pick up the paper and he'd say, ha, look at that. He, he, you know, he would write things to um, Smith like, you know, I think MacArthur may be uh, descended from Moriarty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, or didn't Moriarty invent the atom bomb and things like this? So he was, it was there. He was always thinking about this. It, this was one of his touchstones, the canon. The Sherlock Holmes stories were, he'd been vaccinated by um, Holmes's needle as a boy, I think. And <laughs> it, it never left him. I, I understand that affliction. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> I'm sure Mindy agrees. Uh. Oh, so if people wanted to learn more about Christopher Morley, the man, uh, Christopher Morley, the essayist, uh, what books could you recommend that they pick up, Steve? Well, I'd recommend, and it's out of print now, so I can recommend this safely, I think, um, they they pick up a copy of the Standard Doyle Company. It has all his writings. Well, I found one or two things since, but almost all his writings on Sherlock Holmes. It has a good introduction about his life in general and about his life with Holmes. Um, and I think you'd find any reader would find that interesting. There is a biography uh, that's okay. It's not anything great. Uh, that was written by a woman who lived near where he lived on Long Island. Um, it's Is called Three Hours for Lunch, lunch by yes. Helen McCulley. Oakley. Oakley, yes. And then there is a book in the Twain series of American authors, uh, which again is okay. Um, those would be the best things. And then if you could find um, his brother Frank's My One Contribution to uh, Chess, that would also tell you a lot about growing up Morley in Baltimore in the turn of the century. And that might be amusing. Another way would be to read his semi-autobiographical novel, Thoroughfare, that's T-H-O-R-O-F-A-R-E, which is a street in Woodbridge, um, in the UK, which is where his father came from. Um, in the first section of that, there's a lot about the main character, whose name was Jeffrey, um, growing up both in England and then in Baltimore. And that might help as well. There's a good essay by his brother, Frank, um, that he did for half of her college uh, library associates in the around 1970 71 um so but there's not a lot 
um, several different projects on Morley never actually came to fruition. So uh, I think I've covered the waterfront there. Well, that's a that's a wide ranging list there. Lots for people to choose from. And as you say, uh, not all of these are in print or easy to find, but uh, if you do track them down, they are uh, well worth the read. Um, I suggest you go and check with Denny Dobry, and who sells books for the benefit of the BSI Trust, who may have many of these things. That's a great, great suggestion. Well, uh, Steve, any any uh, final bits of uh, parting wisdom here as uh, we leave you? I think that almost any of your listeners, Scott, Bert, would be enjoy picking up a book of Morley's, almost any book uh, other than the poems. Just avoid the poems. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but pick up any book that you run across, and you'll run across them. They're in used bookshops. They'll, they'll be in older libraries. Um, they won't cost you anything much. Pick one up, read it. I think you'll enjoy it. If you're a reader, if you're someone who thinks of yourself as a person who loves books, you'll like them. If you're someone who thinks of yourself as a person who loves Sherlock Holmes, you'll probably like them. By now, Chris's world is, you know, escaping us. It's already a long time. I mean, he died in 57. He basically stopped writing by 1950. We're talking a while ago. Uh, so his world is 75 years away and more. Um, but look for it. Enjoy it. Think about him. And thank him for uh, helping really create the world of Sherlockiana that thrives today. Well done. Yeah, beautifully said. Well, it's wonderful to visit with Stephen about Christopher Morley and, you know, as someone who shares his, uh, as well as two people who share his affection for Morley, he, um, I lo in fact, I love the way Stephen, you know, described very accurately and better than sentimental, I think, was Stephen's description about Morley's characteristic enthusiasm. And that really does, you know, talk a little bit. That really does bring in the spark of joy that um, that really pertained to so much of what he what he did. And and you know, it's that spark of fellowship really that that has continued with the Baker Street Irregulars. Well, it is. I mean, you know, one of the terms that we hear about uh, bandied about with respect to Christopher Morley's name is kinsprits. Uh, and that stands for kindred spirits. And he was uh, a wonderful uh, encourager of spirits like this. Uh, you know, he was he was an assembler of people. Uh, you know, through a, a common interest, he would bring people together and he would make sure they had fun. And, you know, he not only did this in person at some of these clubs and events that he founded, but of course he also did it through his writing. And one of the quotes about Morley, or by Morley, I should say, because as you mentioned, he is eminently quotable, uh, is, uh, my favorite is, when you sell a man a book, you don't sell him 12 inches of ink and glue. You sell him a whole new life. And that's really what he did, is he gave people a new life, even if it was for a few hours at a time, uh, through this joy, through this enthusiasm, and through his expertise in uh, writing and his love of books. Yeah, he really did. That's very, that's very well. That's very well said. You know, we should point out to our listeners too that at one point, Christopher Morley edited an edition of Bartlett's familiar quotations. Mm. So he's very sensitive to quotations and their power and their joy, and it also gave him an opportunity to list in Bartlett's familiar quotations some quotations of himself. <laughs> I like that. 
The Sherlock Holmes Review is back with articles on Sherlockian film and television, classic canonical scholarship, detective stories, illustrators, collecting, and more. In the latest annual, Curtis Armstrong tells how his love of Sherlock Holmes and acting first came together, how he starred in his first radio series, The Baker Street Theater, while he was still in high school, his encounter with Sherlock Holmes, Hugh Laurie and Lynn manuel Miranda, when he featured in the TV series House, how Sherlock Holmes crossed into his character in the WB series Supernatural, and his role as Inspector Gregson in the audible drama Moriarty, The Devil's Game. The Sherlock Holmes Review is back, combining great design with great writing, welcoming fans of every age and attitude. Get the latest issue, the 2022 Annual, at wessexpress.com today. Well, you know that music, you know what it means. Yes, that's right. It's time for everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz program. It's Canonical Couplet, where we give you two lines of poetry and we ask you to identify which Sherlock Holmes story we're talking about. And the last time we were here, we gave you this clue. It's better, lads, to stay at home and cram than pilfer questions of the Greek exam. <laughs> okay, Bert. This is where I inevitably turn it over to you because I am such a masochist and <laughs> ask you if you know the answer for this episode's canonical couplet. Oh, it's a very tragic story, you know, again, that involved the, the scene in Baker Street, that close community of people that made the life of Sherlock Holmes possible, and the tragedy that occurred to Mrs. Hudson when the creme caramel she'd worked so hard on for dessert was damaged. Uh -oh. It's the case Watson called the crooked flan. I like that music. That's very jolly. Yeah, frolic. I uh, like it. Yeah, those who uh, who know the the trouble that Larry David gets himself into and curb your enthusiasm uh, will recognize that. But um, yes, that is uh, uh, the crooked flan. No, it, it is not the crooked flan. Unfortunately, oh, no, no. no. Uh, you were, you were. I won't even say you were close in this case. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have help from Eric Deckers yet. What? So, no. He must be off and, um, uh, you know, working on uh, other assignments at this point. But... Um, well, then it, how do you know I'm not correct? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, because I'm looking at the answer key. Oh, I don't, I, cheat, Yeah, yeah we shouldn't give away the secrets of the show here. Omne ignotum pro magnifico. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, that was the three students. Yeah, the Greek exam. That was the, uh, the giveaway there. Half a chapter of Thucydides. Um, so yeah, no, no Eric Deckers. However, uh, the good news is we had a number of people uh, contribute answers that were correct. So uh, let's go ahead and give the prize wheel a big spin. See who we're going to pick from the revolving drum today. And it looks like it is number 32. And that corresponds to... Oh, look, it's our friend Edward Lear. Yes. Congratulations, Ed. You got that one. So we will be sending you... Uh, what? Gosh, what was our prize last time? Uh, episode 271. We didn't have a prize. It was a, a vault. A vault prize. Was that? No, I'm sorry. It was one of uh, David Markham's uh, books. Yeah, you, and, and we'll tell you what. We will give you the choice, Ed. Uh, you can pick out which one it is that you would like to get. 
Um, and so for this episode's canonical couplet, I think our prize is going to be something Morley-esque. I think we have a few Morley things in the files here, so that should be easy enough. And and if I can't find anything specific to Morley, then certainly uh, a Baker Street Journal would be appropriate since uh, he was part of the founding there of the Baker Street Journal. So let's get right to it. To send such relics to a nice old lady implies behavior something worse than shady. If you know the answer to this episode's canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct answers and we choose your name at random, you'll win. Good luck. All right. That should be a lot of fun. Well, it certainly should be. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's what we say now. But, um... Well, well, we'll see what you greet me with next time. That'll yeah. always be an adventure. Okay. Mm. Well, that gets us to the part of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere where we talk about Sherlockian news. Do we have a theme for Sherlockian news? Why, yes, we do. Yes, that's right. It's time for the Sherlockian news. All the news that fits, we print. Or at least we put to audio. And maybe it doesn't even fit. We'll probably go outside the boundaries of our podcast here, bulging at the seams, as we Mm. seem to be. Mm. Uh, Well, first off, we have news, uh, an exclusive from The Hollywood Reporter, that, uh, if you recall, we interviewed Charles Kindinger here on episode 245 about uh, his original uh, production, Moriarty, The Devil's Game. It was produced by Audible. Well, we're back for a second series. Now, this is uh, Moriarty, The Silent Order. And we are going to uh, hear none other than Dame Helen Mirren in this production. She's joining a cast that includes Anya Chalotra, Ross McCall, and Ariel Goldman, as well as Dominic Monaghan as Moriarty, and Phil Lamar back as Sherlock Holmes. And I would imagine our friend Curtis Armstrong will be making another turn as Inspector Lestrade, or Lestrade, depending on where you've grown up with your Sherlockian productions. Um, this is uh, once again produced by Tree Fort Media. It's a 10 episode uh, series and uh, it'll be available on November 9th exclusively on Audible. And uh, we find Dame Helen Mirren starring as Lady Milverton, the worst woman in London, uh, blackmailer type. Uh, you know the name Milverton, so her role shouldn't be any kind of surprise to people. Um, but once again, uh, the uh, the cast and crew will be returning for a, what I would imagine will be a wonderfully produced series, as the first was. Yes, and, it and, was the num- number one podcast on the Audible platform. It won was the it? Best, yep, Best Fiction Podcast at the Banff Rocky Awards. And in addition to Curtis coming back, Billy Harris is coming back, and Chaloter from The Witcher is joining the ensemble in the role of Agatha, a young maid with secrets. Ah, I like that. I like that a lot. Well, I can imagine, or I can almost hear you asking no. yourself, Bert, how no. is it Not curious. No. Audible is able to get away with producing a new audio drama amidst the SAG-AFTRA Strike. Nope, could care less. No, not curious. <laughs> well, allow me to answer that non existent question in your mind. Uh, it turns out that uh, Audible doesn't fall under the traditional SAG after TV theatrical arrangements. It actually has a special bespoke agreement with Audible and, and its uh, audiobooks division. Hmm. And that covers original audio content. So it's non struck work, which is fortunate. Uh, We get to uh, hear some new Sherlock Holmes audio content this fall. Hmm. So uh, stay tuned for that coming on November 9th from Audible. Excellent. 
Well, and our friend, our much admired friend, the publisher Otto Penzler, has announced he's creating a new Penzler Publishers imprint called Crime Inc., which will launch in the spring of 2024. And the first title will be The Serial Killer's Apprentice by Catherine Ramsland and Tracy Ullman. And also Otto... Uh, and Nick Meyer, within the last, oh, I don't know, a couple of weeks, have announced that Nick's next Sherlock Holmes book, which is Sherlock Holmes and the Telegram from Hell, will be uh, published by uh, one of Otto's imprints, not Crime, Inc., uh, but... Uh, another one of Otto. Anyway, Otto is publishing Nick's next book, and that'll be out next uh, year, I believe. Superb. Well, that'll uh, undoubtedly be another wonderful adventure, as uh, Nick has stopped in here from time to time to talk to us about his continuing Sherlock Holmes pastiches. Yeah. Well, finally, we have, uh, I guess this can be best quantified as some Sherlockian gossip. (laughs) Uh, If you have gone to London, or if you're familiar with London, of course you know that the Sherlock Holmes Museum exists there. Technically, at 239 Baker Street, uh, they have absconded with the 221B address, um, which is indicative of the... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the way they do business there. But uh, earlier this year, John Adenantz, who founded the museum, uh, served a sentence in jail. Uh, now he controls the museum again, and he won a suit against his brother to do that. So uh, lo- lots of fun going on between the Adenantz family members. But now, now Honoria Cartledge, yes, that's her name, uh, she was fired from her job as senior manager there. A hundred and twenty thousand pound a year job. That's not bad. Um, she uh, has uh, filed a uh, a suit against the museum. She didn't win the five hundred thousand pound bonus that she said she was promised, but uh, the judge ruled that the museum directors, including Cartilage's ex girlfriend, dismissed her unfairly, and she was entitled to least to uh, unlawful deduction of holiday pay (laughs) so and who better to cover this dramatic saga than the daily mail (laughs) we'll have a a link in the show notes to this and all the other stories now we've been doing these podcasts for a long while how are we coming on all that back holiday pay i mode (laughs) <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Bert, if you would like to sue your brother or Honoria Cartilage's ex-girlfriend, uh, yeah. you can do that. Yeah. Oh. Good oh. luck. Well, that's not the sort of warm, responsive answer I was hoping for. <laughs> well, <laughs> what are you going to do? That's right. Not uh-huh. a lump of coal in your stocking, Monty. <laughs> Uh, somebody's got to get it. Somebody's got to get it, yeah. Well, I suppose we ought to close up shop here. We've done enough damage in these parts. Uh, this is the uh, the always <laughs> lumpy Scott Monty. And this is the Rutherford Burtwalder. And together <laughs> we comprise a minor character in the old television series, Leave it to Beaver. And I still remember that wonderful time when Jerry Mathers, at the end of each episode, would look at the camera and say, The game's, games of foot. Of foot. <laughs> The The game's a foot! You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.